This is the Citrus Experience Podcast, brought to you by Citrus Men. We're passionate about growing premium grafted citrus trees and helping you on your growing journey. Whether you're a seasoned gardener or emerging green thumb, this series is for you. We share expert advice, insider knowledge, and practical tips you can apply because we know and grow citrus. Well, hello and welcome to the Citrus Men podcast. I'm Susan Burns. And I'm Gary Isles. And in this episode, this is going to be funny, we're doing some myth busting. Of all the plants in the, on the planet, I don't think there is one that has so many curals and snake oil and old folk tales around it than a citrus t- <laughs> so the citrus tree. Would you agree? Hi, Susan. Yes, yes, there's all sorts of uh, snake oils and uh, myths out there that um, some of them have a little bit of truth to them. Um, but yeah, well, it'd be nice to go through it uh, yes. and um, and do a bit of busting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to just debunk a few of them. But look, our lovely listeners, if um, if we haven't mentioned one of your favourite little myths, uh, let us know. Uh, but I do think we could probably write a book about the tales of citrus and the little stories around them. So, uh, Gary, look, let's start with a, a very popular one. Epsom salts. People just love to whack on the Epsom salts. They're quite nice in a bath, but uh, what, do you, what do you think about them being a citrus tree? <laughs> well, um, Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate. Uh, there's, it's certainly true that that citrus do like magnesium. Uh, it's one of the you know they if it's if it's in short supply they will show certain patterns in the leaves. So I can see where this started. Um, but it's it's difficult to put one element on a plant and uh, expect it to solve all, all problems. You upset the balance. So you, you know, we have macro elements and micro elements, and magnesium is one of those micro elements. It's probably the one we in most demand by citrus, but it's um, it's a micro element. So if you go putting a handful of Epsom salts on on your plant, whether it's in a container or in the ground, you're going to upset the balance. And the balance is what we're all about. That's why we keep harping about, you know, using a good organic fertilizer and just topping with with a chemical fertilizer if need be. I mean, it's something that's got all the elements. Don't upset the balance. So don't go running for the Epsom salts. <laughs> if you if you see some patterning on the leaves, just go for a good broad base fertilizer that's got the macro elements and the micro elements in the right balance yes. so we don't want to upset the balance so i can see where this started because citrus do like magnesium but let's uh let's just let's keep it in the keep bathroom it calm. keep the yes. Epsom salts in the bathroom <laughs> or the laundry that's I right the laundry. i think the other important point here gary is that People love to think they've got a deficiency with their plant and that they need to go, oh, well, I've heard that Epsom salts is good. But you can also tip it way the other way and get what we call a toxicity, which can sort of show up with similar kind of looking patternings or weird things happening. And people keep thinking, oh, it's a deficit of something when you could actually be giving it way too much or something. Yes, there's there's subtle differences in the patterning. Um, whether whether it's a deficiency or a toxicity, and it's a subtle difference between the different elements as well. That's right. You can go from deficiency to toxicity very easily. Mm-hmm. So, like we're saying, stay stay with the the balance and um, and don't go shoving one element onto onto your onto your plants. Yeah, yeah. So there isn't really there isn't any point. Like you can. Maybe not so much anymore, but you used to be able to go into a garden centre and you used to be able to find all those little little micronutrients or ingredients that you could really tinker around and it's like it's just fraught. You are not gyrogealers. Or maybe you are gyrogealers. Maybe you are, but you might be a scientist. I don't know, but it's it's complicated. Keep it simple. People have done the work for you. There's fabulous fertilisers out there, just as Gary says. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. The other thing we might mention, Susan, is that sometimes it's it's not related to the elements in the soil. 
it can be related to the root temperature. So the, there's as roots are cooling through autumn and into the and into the winter, then sometimes they can't pick up the elements because the because the roots are, are cold and they're not running at full bottle. So mm-hmm. so it may not be that there is a is a deficiency in the soil. It might be just that it's that time of the year the plants can't should... pick it up and the the fruits there's fruit on the tree, so it's dragging the elements out of the tree. So just be patient. Yes. Um, and you know, and and give you normal good fertilizer as the as the plants warming up and away we go. Yes. Look, I we didn't talk about this, but sugar, that's another one I've heard people. I mean I've quite I suggested it myself. If a plant's a little bit poorly, that you could mix up a little if you didn't have any citrus booster on hand, you could mix up some sugar in some water and put it on and that's like the cellulose it's sort of it's sort of like a bit of a sh- it's like when you're feeling a bit poorly and you have a barley sugar but again it's just a one off hit you you're just perking the plant up to give it some fertilizer so uh, yeah no I I've, 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 I've never I've never I've never done the sugar thing Susan so <laughs> I'll keep away from that as well <laughs> ah sorry um all right so let look this is a good a good position for us to talk about the difference between a tonic and a fertilizer. So, when a plant is a bit poorly, it's sometimes not. A, it is a good idea not to go cranking on and chucking heavy duty fertilizer on it. It needs to again. It's like a little bit of chicken soup. It needs something. But can you explain to our lovely listeners, Gary, the difference between a tonic? And a fertilizer. Well, a tonic is almost what it says. It's a pick me up. It's a little. It's a tonic. It 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 might. It'll. It's a bit hormonal. You know, plant hormone sort of thing that it 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 um, sparks that that side of the plant up, um, but it doesn't give you the the nutrient that you need for 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 good growth. So it's a bit of, in combination. With a fertilizer, fertilizer supplies the nutrients that the plant needs. Tonic is a is a is a pick me up. Doesn't particularly supply um, the nutrients that the plant needs. So they're they're good in combination, um, but but a tonic won't do won't supply the nutrition that a fertil- that a fertilizer will. So you, you 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 if you're using a tonic, you still need to give the plant good nutrition. It's a bit probably like having a vitamin pill to boost you like your iron levels or something but you still that wouldn't stop you eating a full hearty meal that's got everything you need for a complete and wholesome diet yes yes yeah yeah everything so, in moderation yeah like, and um, be- my father taught me <laughs> he taught you well Gary. <laughs> uh i think too because citrus booster is a liquid don't think that that's like other liquid fert it's a it is a complete fertilizer. It's a, it's got a NPK rating. It's got all it's quite complete. So even though it's very gentle, it is actually a fertilizer. It's it's not a tonic. Yeah, and that's something that people can look for on the on the bottle when they're looking and they see something they say, Well, this is a tonic or a fertilizer. You can see the analysis on on the bottle. So if you're looking for NPK and then the micro elements then you know you're getting some nutrition out of it Mm -hmm. which is important Um, yeah very important yeah absolutely so all right let's go back to these uh little myths pollinators citrus do they just do it by themselves or do they need a friend in the garden gary no no they don't need a they don't need a a friend or a pollinator in the garden other fruit trees yes but but citrus, they uh, they don't need a pollinator; they're self-pollinating. Uh, and also, there's another aspect to pollinators with citrus, is that if some some um, varieties, let's say Clementine mandarin, just to pick a good example of this, My Clementine goodness. mandarin is when it's grown in isolation. In other words, it's not cross-pollinating with other citrus. It it will be seedless or almost seedless. So, but if it cross pollinates with a with a seeded variety, say Valencia orange, 
um, then it will have seeds. So it's it's uh, it's just one of those little quirky things with citrus. Um, not always the case, but certain certain um, varieties will be seedless if they don't cross pollinate. But they they self pollinate, no seeds. If they cross pollinate, more seeds. Interesting. Interesting. Just a little fun fact. <laughs> The fun facts of a citrus tree. Yes, okay, so self-pollinating, you can just buy one tree, have one tree, and everything will be perfect. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, how many parties have you been to, Gary? Boys, go pee on the lemon tree. Pe- people, what is it? Pe- people love to pee on the citrus tree. Why? <laughs> I, know, it's uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I've, um, I, I hear it. I, I still hear it. I just We used to hear it years ago. We've got a little bit more sophisticated nowadays, but yes. <laughs> hopefully. Um, but, yeah, look, it's, uh, again, <laughs> good nutrition, regular water, best thing you can do. So uh, don't go <laughs> – you don't need to do that to have have – good produce six citrus trees <laughs> just stick to what we're saying good nutrition regular water and away you go <laughs> yes because i think it is there is a uh, micro element urea which is uh which, <laughs> but it's micro and it's uh it's in your fertilizer and just like your epsom salts in the bathroom uh go wee in the toilet <laughs> it's not yeah we just don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah, no, no. Be be much more sophisticated, please. Be sophisticated. Um, <laughs> okay, that's right. right. Uh, just Are a little note on urea while we're talking about um, yes. about about um, about fertilizer. So you can buy urea as a, a as a fertilizer, um, and it's a good form of nitrogen. But it's not a form of nitrogen that I particularly like. It's uh, it's very volatile and very available. Um, and if we want some nitrogen, I'd rather it be part of a of a complete package, whether it comes through an organic fertilizer or a, or a general fertilizer. Um, yeah, I don't like using urea in one just as one form of nitrogen. It's yeah. not. It's it's a bit it's a bit savage for you. Bearing in mind, citrus are very surface rooted, so when you put something on the top of the the soil or the or the potting mix, the roots are just there. Yeah. So you yeah, you right. you. That's why I keep saying we want to be gentle because the roots are just there, and bang, it's a it's it's. If it goes with something like urea, it's immediately hitting those roots, and it's a bit much for them. Be gentle. Yeah. But just yeah, a little and, side note while we're going. Yeah. No. That, and it's an interesting point, Gary, because I think that's also why we always say, you know, keep that um, soil around your citrus, either in your pot or in the garden. Keep it nice and open and friable and covered with a nice light mulch so, you know, the roots can sort of tinker around under there and it, it keeps it all happy. And it's it's kind of a bit like a buffer, isn't it? It just uh, break, breaking down and the roots are just, it's just, yeah, sort of like a sand. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very, yeah, I like mulches. I like, I like as we mentioned before, I do like sugarcane mulch because mm-hmm. it's, uh, it, you know, it's... Uh, easily available and um you know it, it's uh it breaks down holds moisture um and uh and and helps look after that plant like you say it's a little buffer on the surface and mm-hmm. it's yeah mm-hmm. yeah good stuff now okay so we've we've, we've cleared that one up for everybody <laughs> what about uh you can grow citrus we've talked about it before you can grow citrus indoors it's it is a european thing you ha- do, we'll see it on Insta and TikToks and people growing uh, their citrus inside. Uh, just quickly, your thoughts around growing a citrus indoors? Well, I, what I'd say that they will survive inside. They're, they're, it needs to be a good position. Um, it needs to be light. Um, and, and we go back to the European experience where yes they have you know very severe winters so they bring they put their their plants inside because they they're just too cold for citrus outside and also if we go back to in history to the orangeries of of Europe where they would bring the plants in big containers outside for the summer 
and then put them inside um, in a you know a, a fairly light um, situation, but but enclosed mm -hmm. um, for the winter. Uh, very common in European history. Um, those of us that have been lucky enough to go to Versailles and see that wonderful car, um, castle, mm. um, there's a huge orangery there, that, and they still do it. They still mm. bring them out mm. for the summer, put them inside, and they've got trees years old. But for the normal, for us here in Australia, you know, our climate's so much better in, for, for growing citrus that you don't need it. But, again, you could have... A, a small, you know, a small kumquat, calamansi, something like that. That's the fruits outside. You can bring that in, um, put it in, in a night lie situation. Mm. If it's got fruit on, it's as good as a, it's as good as a, a bunch of flowers. So, um, yeah, we they will come inside, and uh, but I would say growing inside completely, um, that's a bit different. But they will survive by inside, and but they need that outside for a while to to get going and look good. Yeah, so that's the key word. They'll survive inside, they'll cope, but they won't really grow. And they won't certainly, it's very hard to, I don't know how you get fruit. You'd have to have a little trained bee that came inside and just just wouldn't work. <laughs> well, they will flower. They, yeah, if you took them out, took them out in, in the springtime when they're going to flower and then get them flowering and, and let them set some fruit, then that's the best thing to do. Yeah, complicated, complicated. Don't, don't complicate <laughs> your life. All right, so no. another little funny thing that people like. And it, actually, it's not funny. It's not funny. If you have an incursion, a little pesty like scale or aphid or something, and you want to control it, it's good to think about options that are safe for you and safe for the environment. But environment, but soapy water all the time is not is it good is it bad soapy water what do you think about chucking what? soapy water on your tree well uh, firstly scale insects and some other insects don't like it so it it can be effective so it it, it would it will work but my concern is if you if you put keep putting soapy water on the plant the water's going to end up in the root zone with all that detergent, um, and that's not going to be good. So once off, not a, I don't think that's a problem, um, and it, w it will help s suppress the um, any in some insect infestations, not all, but some. Um, so yes, but but just be in my, bear in mind where that soapy water is going to end up. Mm -hmm. It's going to end up in your root, root zone, mm -hmm. and that's that's going to upset the balance that we've talked about, um, yeah, and and just clog it up. So I I I don't do it. No, well, good goodness me! Imagine you going out with buckets of warm soapy water, Gary. You'd be there <laughs> from dawn till dusk. Yeah, but <laughs> that, it's, um, it, it's another subject for another time. But there are so much better options. With, and, and also being environmentally friendly. So we might talk about that some yes. other some other time. But there are there are other options that uh, that that are uh, will do the job and not injure the environment. Yes, and look, certainly it has a little place. And I always think too, it's good if you do do that. It's not a bad idea to hose to hose the tree off afterwards. Just just move that soap off a bit, but. Uh, don't do what I have seen, which is kind of weird, unless you've got a lot of time, is go over with a little toothbrush and clean all the... <laughs> no, this, you've got better things to do. Uh, all right, so yep. just take it easy with the soap. And certainly if you were doing it, make sure it's a natural soap. Don't use one of those palm olive or fairy dishwashing liquid. Just make sure it's a chemical-free... Uh, I think there used to be one called Clenzel. I don't know if it's still around, Clenzel. Um, that that used to be. Not I don't know. Yeah. 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 And um, I think the best thing is to steer clear. Steer clear. Yes. All right. So uh, what what about this? I've I've actually had this happen where I, I, I've seen a tree and, and 
cut little tree covered, covered, covered in fruit. And the person say, oh, this tree, it's so healthy. It looks so fabulous. It's absolutely laden with fruit. Uh, no. Is that, what's the story, Gary? What's going on with a little tree or an overladen tree? Yes. Yeah, I don't like small trees that have, that are that are covered in fruit. It can be an indication that they're struggling a bit and they're, you know, nature's, you know, we're, I've said this before, we're dealing with Mother Nature here, so, you know, we have to see what she's up to. And uh, sometimes it's, you know, it's a survival thing. And if uh, if a small tree is covered in fruit, it may be a survival mechanism. It's not doing too well, but, you know, un- under the ground in the root zone possibly. Uh, and it's uh, decided that it needs to fruit as much as it can to to um, to survive mm. as as a species. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, in that situation, certainly, I I I like to tell people in the first year or so, the tree's better with no fruit. So if it does flower and fruit, take it off just to get some root growth and some size in the plant, and then and, and then let it fruit. Um, if it's if it's a small tree and it's fruiting that much as well, even if there isn't a a, a problem there, then it's not going to grow because it's growing fruit. Mm. So let's let's lessen the load um, and uh, and get that that plant off and away with some nice root growth and and um, gro- growth on the top. Mm, yes, because the fruit takes so much energy away from the plant. It's just. Oh, it's stressful. When I see it, I feel stressed. It's not relaxing looking at a tree <laughs> like that, Gary. Now, look, and you'll I, get small fruit as well. Yes, and not nice. It'll be fruit. very small fruit. See, and it'll be no, seedy no. because the tree's going, I have to make babies. I have to produce lots of seed because I'm going to die. So I've got to make lots of seedy fruit. Uh, no, it's not a good situation. Anyway. Yep. Uh, take the fruit off. When in doubt, take the fruit off. Now, look, but we've I think we've touched on it with Epsom salts, with sugar, but also another little myth that you'll often hear is that, oh, eggshells, citrus love eggshells. And I suppose that's a calcium. What do you think, Gary? Well, citrus do, do like calcium. It's uh, one of their major elements, um, but I don't think they're going to get much out of an eggshell. <laughs> so uh, the eggshell eggshell's very inert. Um, so uh, yeah, again, to crush up eggshells, you're better off doing what we've been saying all along. Just get a nice, complete fertilizer, a regular application. Keep that nutrient flowing through to the plant. Eggshells will take years to break down. Uh, yes. But no harm. No harm. No good. You know, you're not going to hurt the tree. Um, by doing it, if, if that's what you want to do, but don't expect there to be any gain. No, no, it's it's a funny thing. I see it. <laughs> not that I've yeah. Anyway, I've seen it on YouTube a lot. And I think that's geeky. Um, and even in the compost bin, uh, uh, eggshells take forever to break down. So you know, look, put your eggshells in with your other mix of general things in the compost bin. Make a nice compost and then put that on the tree. Don't need to dry out your eggshells and cr- again, people. Do you ha- not have enough things to do that you're brushing your citrus tree with a toothbrush <laughs> and grinding up eggshells? No, better things to do. Buy a citrus book and sit under your citrus tree and read it. Uh, look, uh, I think we've probably covered them, but look, seriously, if anyone has a little myth that they'd like to share with us, we'd love to hear it. So maybe now your citrus IQ has increased. Uh, our, our message is don't stress and go Googling around looking for the answers. It's generally pretty simple. Ask yourself the basic question. Have I given it a complete fertiliser? So don't overcomplicate it. And uh, certainly the taxi driver is not the citrus expert. Gary Isles. Correct. Citrus men. <laughs> uh, so look, in closing, yep. um, I just wanted to because I, I know that if people are listening to the podcast, they can't see this unless they go on YouTube. But look at this fruit, Gary, this mandarin with this big long neck. It's known by Yes, finally we've 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 finally we've uh, been able to source this uh, variety and um, we're going to have it available for citrus men in the near future. Yes, yes. So uh Very it's uh, it's come coming along, yes, and um 
we've got our own name for it um, yes. and we've made that name from its parentage and we're calling it Ponkonomi. Now, once you've said it a couple of times, you'll remember it. <laughs> so, uh, so, but we will be, we'll, we'll be speaking the, more about it. Yes, I want to just ask Gary what the parents are of this beautiful mandarin. Uh, Konami and Konami and Ponkan Mandarin. So we've yes. combined those two names to uh, yeah. And this is it's uh, been around around the world for a while and a number of different names. Um, some of them have um, intellectual property rights to them, so we they're they're um, un- we can't use those names. That's fair enough. Um, but it's uh, we've now got a, a public variety in Australia that we can uh, we can grow. So we've got it um, propagated, and before long we'll uh, we'll have it available. Yeah, it'll be released. Well, I'd say like when this episode goes live, hopefully. Um, but it's a, look, it's a beautiful thing. It's very popular. Uh, we get a lot of questions around it. It's a delicious, big, juicy, seedless mandarin that's like beautiful to peel and very, ooh, it's delicious. I can't wait to eat those ones, actually. So, uh, yeah, look out for that. Um, uh, that'll be available on the Citrus Men site. So uh, in closing, thanks, Gary. That was super interesting, uh, busting those myths. Uh, and um, oh, thanks, the, Susan. yeah, and in our next episode, um, we're gonna look. We're gonna guide you along to look for some of the clues uh, to indicate that your citrus might be a little bit off color, and um, yeah, what what those signs might be, and how you can just sort of tip it back, and, and what's happening with your tree. Not always, it's not always fertilizer. There's other things going on. So, tune in to that next time, and. Um, Gary, I'll look forward to chatting with you then about our most favourite thing, citrus. citrus. <laughs> we will. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Gary. Thanks for listening. For resources and contact details relevant to this episode, please see the show notes. Subscribe to Citrus Experience so you know when the next episode goes live. And follow Citrus Men on social media for more great content.